Welcome everybody to a new episode of Beyond the Patterns. Today I have the great pleasure to announce Dr. Julio Vera Gonzalez, who is a long-term collaborator with our lab and he is working in systems biology and bioinformatics. He is a physicist working in medical systems biology since 2005. Since 2013, he is a professor of systems tumor immunology at the University Clinic Erlangen and also a professor at FAU Erlangen Nuremberg. His expertise is in mathematical modeling, bioinformatics, and network biology. In these fields, he applies multi criteria decision algorithms to advance biomedicine. Today, he will be presenting computational modeling of the gene regulatory networks in cancer methods and applications to detect predictive signatures. Julio, it's a great pleasure to have you here. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation and the stage is yours. Many thanks for, for this kind of introduction, Andreas. I, I want to start uh, uh, telling a bit about uh, my life uh, and, and how I ended up here in Erlangen. So actually, I come from Spain. Probably you have noticed it from the name. Yeah, I come from Canary Island, you know, Spain. Uh, these uh, islands in the very, very south of Europe. And then I also uh, mentioned that uh, many people ask me always uh, about this. So we, we have a university in Canary Islands from the 18th century. So uh, it started, initiated the activities uh, more or less at the same time that the university, the university of Erlangen. And then there I studied physics and uh, I studied physics there because Canary Islands is a very good place for astrophysics. We have a very good dark, clear sky and very large telescopes. So it's a very good place for making astrophysics. And then actually after that, I studied biochemistry and molecular biology because I was very much interested in the complexity of life. And because uh, I thought it was really funny, the possibility to mix mathematics and physics together with uh, biology. And then after that, I, I came to Germany uh, because uh, Germany is the land of the uh, ideas. And also because uh, for Spaniards, Germany is always is a synonym for high technology. And this is where I was, uh, this is essentially my first encounter with German high technology in 2005, uh, when I came to, to Rostock in the very north of Germany. The reality is that I came to Germany because uh, Germany was and is still a hot, uh, hot spot for what we call uh, systems biology and systems medicine. And this is actually what, I, what I'm going to explain through the whole uh, talk, what is systems biology and how this can be applied in cancer. Um, yes, so this is my, the starting point of my, of my talk. No? So if you talk with an experimental biologist, they will always tell you that everything in biology is about uh, molecules. So it's about genes, it's about uh, proteins, uh, but if you talk with someone who is actually into systems biology or systems medicine, we have a slightly different opinion about this. We think that everything in biology is about networks of interacting molecules. So usually molecules, genes don't uh, work in isolation. They are integrated into networks and they interact with each other. And actually what we have found over the last 15 years or so is that these biochemical or biological networks are actually very large. Just to give you an idea, this is a network uh, uh, my team here in Erlangen reconstructed to represent uh, the genes and the proteins that get activated in macrophages, so a special type of immune cells, when uh, we get infection. As you see, the level of complexity we are talking here is very similar to the one one can find in electronic circuits. So we are talking of about modules that interact with each other in large uh, networks. And this is actually one of the key ideas of systems biology, and that's also uh, why 
Uh, many people who make systems biology are actually computer uh, engineers and informaticians. The other important point is that these biochemical networks are structurally complex. So this essentially means that uh, many of those genes we are mentioning interact with dozens or hundreds or even thousands of other genes. But also it's structurally complex because these genes are enriched in uh, regulatory motifs like negative and, and positive feedback loops. And very, very important, some of the key properties of living systems are actually in, induced by this type of uh, feedback, uh, positive and negative feedback loops. For example, homeostasis or irreversible differentiation of cells or any or, or of these uh, high level features of biological systems. So, I mean, if you put all these things together, what we have essentially that is that this is actually the perfect storm for the classical way of making biochemistry and molecular biology and biomedicine. Because what we are talking here is quite far from this idyllic image many experimentalists have that they can work all their life into a single pathway with few molecules that interact with each other with simple interactions. So here we are talking about actually large and complex uh, networks. But on the other hand, this scenario is ideal for uh, what I call and what we call in our community network biology and systems biology. And then let me give you a quick introduction about what is systems biology. So systems biology is a new approach, an approach that is applying uh, molecular biology and cell biology. And the key idea of this approach is that we make use of different types of mathematical modeling and computational modeling to uh, integrate experimental data and address biomedical uh, questions. And we think this approach is necessary because as I said, these networks we are talking about are enriched in regulatory uh, feedback loops that interact with each other. Also because biology and biomedicine is more and more about getting a lot of uh, different types of quantitative data and integrate them. And for this, we know, and you know, computational models are the right tool. And finally, because many times the basic key features uh, of uh, living systems are about dynamics. So it's about how the system evolves over time and space. And for that, again, uh, computational models are a very good tool. So then essentially one of the key questions of all uh, what we do here is uh, to work with the reconstruction and the computational modeling of, of gene and regulatory networks. And the approach we use in, a, in our laboratory, it has something special, and that is that we integrate methods and, um, uh, and algorithms for, from bioinformatics together with different types of computational models. So here the idea essentially is that we uh, investigate or we uh, elucidate the structure of the networks using bioinformatic algorithms and databases. And then we investigate the function of the networks using computational model. So how the, the workflow of the method we use and many others in this field use is the following more or less. So you essentially collect information and data about the system you want to in, uh, investigate uh, from the literature and from a number of existing databases. So you collect which genes and which proteins are important and which interactions you have uh, between them. And what we do next is essentially we collect all this information to create networks, what we call regulatory maps. And then these networks can be mined and can be investigated using uh, network biology, uh, biology algorithms. And using these algorithms, we ended up selecting a uh, a core of this network that is relevant, and this core of the network, we, uh, we model it using different types of computational and mathematical models, and we calibrate uh, or train the models using uh, existing or uh, experimental data produced for this. No? So at the end of the story, once you have your, your model uh, calibrated, we make uh, computational simulations to make predictions. So we try to predict how these cells, these tumor cells, for example, react in given uh, biological scenarios and the information we get from the simulation, we use it to formulate hypotheses or to generate uh, predictive signatures. I, I, in, in this uh, talk, essentially, I want, I want to focus more of, of the time 
in the work uh, we have done for a number of years, uh, elucidating the role that a given uh, molecule, so the transcription factor E2F1, uh, plays in uh, metastasis, in cancer metastasis, and in the resistant to therapies. This is uh, essentially what we are going to talk most of the time. And this is because uh, we know now that uh, most of the mortality uh, linked to cancer, it actually is related to the emergence of this uh, metastasis or this ability of the tumors to spread locally or systemic in the body. And uh, also because usually uh, very often these metastases are resistant to the therapies we have available for the patients. Also because we also have found that the therapies are able to induce uh, resistance to the therapies. So it's uh, important to investigate all these uh, features. So then our idea was to make use of this network biology and system biology approaches to try to detect gene signatures that have the ability to predict uh, metastasis and resistance to therapy. And this is essentially something we did in a, in a project together with uh, some experimentalists and other computer, computational biologists in Germany. Uh, the idea here is we wanted to create comprehensive maps on the regulation of this gene in cancer. We wanted to construct computational models and calibrate, train the computational models with uh, existing experimental data, and uh, data from patients. And then we wanted to use these models to make uh, essentially predictions about uh, predictive signatures uh, for therapy resistance, for example. We, I mean, this, this uh, molecule is important because it's what is called a transcription factor that is very central to the regulation of the cell cycle of the normal cells, but also the tumor cells. So, you know, the cell cycle is a machinery that the cells use to control how they proliferate. So it's very central for normal cells, but also especially for tumor cells. And this protein has a, a very special feature. It, it has a dual role related to cancer because on the one hand, it can be what we call a tumor suppressor. So this means this is a very good protein that defends uh, us against cancer because it participates in the repair of the DNA and because it also regulates some of the mechanisms uh, we have in the body to kill tumor cells, for example, apoptosis and autophagy. But on the other hand, it can also be a very bad molecule, what we call an oncogene, because it helps uh, growing the blood vessels in the tumors and it helps making the cells uh, metastatic. Yeah, so then essentially uh, we, we have been working on this over a number of years and uh, the first contribution we have done in this, I, uh, I want to show is reflected in this paper. So here the idea is we wanted to construct a network and uh, simulate a network accounting for how this protein was able to induce or to participate in the chemoresistance of tumor cells. So then what we did essentially is we follow more or less the approach I uh, indicated before. So we collected information and constructed a regulatory map the special case here is that uh, our approach in this uh, case was to create not a large comprehensive network, but a sub network that was focused on the proteins that we were interested in at that point, at least this transcription factor, another transcription factor called P73, and some other important molecule called Micronite 205. So then our network was essentially focused or, uh, uh, in these three uh, molecules, and then we grew a network around them uh, including additional interactions that were important for chemoresistance. For example, we put here that uh, how different uh, types of uh, genotoxic cancer drugs can trigger the activation of this circuit. We also wanted to include how these uh, molecules here were able to control, to um, trigger the expression uh, of a number of other molecules that control uh, apoptosis, which is the main mechanism that you try to trigger through genotoxic drugs, so a mechanism to tell tumor cells you have to die now. And then because there are other drugs that are also playing a role here, we wanted to enlarge our network to consider the role of these other drugs, the so-called cyto cytotoxic drugs, which are able to somehow stop uh, the proliferation of the cells. So with all these ideas in mind, what we did essentially is we made use of some bioinformatic uh, pipelines and we collect information 
on a number of uh, databases and algorithms. Here I'm, I'm listing some of them. And we pull all this information to, together to create a network. And this is essentially how this network looks like. As you see, this is a network that is essentially focused around the three molecules we were interested, E2F1, P73, and this uh, Micron 205 And then we grow uh, the network that contains other molecules that interact with this of them alone or uh, in combination. What we found, and this is a key point, is that this network is enriching fee forward loops. Huh? And this is one of the key uh, uh, features that we wanted to investigate with our computational model. So then the next step is essentially we took this map, we selected relevant parts of this uh, network and transformed it into a mathematical modeling in ordinary differential equations. So here the, the criteria to select the relevant part of the model was essentially we selected few targets that were representing uh, entire families of targets with similar uh, regulation. So then, so the idea was to transform this into an OD model and to use this OD model to connect the dynamics on how the, this molecular network is regulated to uh, some of the basic cancer cell functions and how the, cell, the cancer cells react to the therapy. So then our network was composed essentially by our mathematical model by three modules. The first one is the, the, first one is the core uh, module that contains the interactions between these three uh, molecules we mentioned. Then we have a second model that con contains the connection between our key factors and the transcriptional uh, targets we selected. And there's a, ther a third module that essentially connects all these molecules to the population of tumor cells. And this essentially is, uh, contains equations that helps uh, or re represent how the cell decides to go either for apoptosis or decide to, to die after uh, the administration of a drug or whether they decide to proliferate. So this is essentially how the, the, the total scheme of the model looks like. And I'm not going to show you all the equations, just uh, I want to give you two basic ideas. Uh, one of them is the equations we are using are ordinary differential equations. And here, for example, you have the structure of one of the equations we are using one, uh, the one that accounts for this uh, protein here. And the other basic idea is that the way we wanted to use the model is essentially reflected here. Our idea is we wanted to simulate the administration of the drug, which is represented in the first panel here, and see using the model how the drug propagates and change the expression and the activation of our key molecules and later on, how the, the changes in the activation of these molecules induce changes in the targets, and ultimately how all this uh, together make an effect on the tumor cell population. How, for example, promote the death of the tumor cells or how this makes proliferate the cells. Yeah, and then the idea was to use the mathematical model to simulate and to obtain uh, gene signatures uh, coming from this, uh, from this model. How we did this is what I represent in this scheme here. So essentially we took the model, we randomly perturb uh, the model parameters many times, as you see there, around the nominal configuration of our computational model. Then with this random uh, perturbation in the model parameters, we make a number of simulations. Essentially we simulated three different scenarios of the, of the system. So how the cells behave when nothing happens to them, how the cells behave when you administer a genotoxic drug, and how the cells uh, react when you administer the cytost cytostatic drug, so a different type of drug. And then, so we run the simulations for these three uh, scenarios and collect what happened at the end of the simulation for all these randomly perturbed uh, uh, model parameter sets. And at the end, what we did essentially is we collect all of them and we created this figure you have here. Essentially, in this figure, uh, it's a bit complicated, but you see every different color here is representing one subpopulation of the random uh, parameter we generated. So you see, for example, the, the gray one is the entire population of randomly generated uh, parameters. The orange one is 
uh, representing which one of them behave as a tumor. Then this, this blue uh, light color is representing which solutions, which parameters actually were able to induce uh, resistance to a genotoxic drug. The green one accounted for those that induce resistance to a cytostatic drug, and the red one accounts for those that uh, uh, induce uh, resistance to both of them. And then what we have here is what happened to the expression values of the uh, uh, molecules in our network in these different uh, scenarios and these different subpopulations we found. Uh, and then here we use, this is a, a box plot uh, of uh, the different populations we found. As you see here, what we found is that for some of the, not for all of them, but for some of the markers, for, for some of the proteins and the genes we consider in our model, there were clear cut different, there were clear cut differences between the normal uh, population of tumors and those that were able to, for example, uh, resist to the cytostatic drug. And the idea here was that this information could be used to somehow generate uh, in silico model-based signatures that could predict further resistance to the therapy. So our idea was that at the end, we could generate tables like the one you see here in which we could decide whether the, the tumor, if you take a sample from a patient and you profiling and you measure the expression of these proteins, we could decide whether this tumor, this patient would be resistant or not to the two drugs we consider here, depending on the, on the expression values for combinations of, of these factors we have in the model. So that was essentially the basic idea. And what I can tell you is that essentially we found out that the approach actually worked because when we compare some of our model predictions with uh, in vitro experiments, performed by our uh, collaborators, we found out that the predictions were actually correct. But on the other hand, the problem we found here is that if you use all the models to generate your signatures, you cannot scale to very large networks because it's very difficult to construct and to train computational models in ordinary differential equations if you have to account for hundreds of, of, of molecules. So in this, in this case, what uh, we next did is we follow a different approach. Uh, so, and this is what I'm going to show you in this second paper we have with the same collaborators. So here the idea is we, we created a larger comprehensive network and we use a different computational approach to mine the network. And our idea at the end was to compare the signatures we generated with the computational model with actual uh, signatures from patient data. Yes, so to briefly explain you what we did here, again, we collected information to construct a network, but this time the network was far larger. Here you see, for example, how it looks the preliminary version of the network we did through manual curation. Our collaborators read a lot of uh, papers on this topic and collect all the information to create this network with several hundreds of uh, factors and several thousands of interactions. And we later on uh, enlarge this network using computational algorithms. So then once we have the network, what we wanted to do actually was to detect in this large network what we call a core regulatory network. So they're really the few very important proteins and genes in the network that somehow control uh, for the resistance to the therapy or for the aggressiveness, the metastatic potential of the, of the cancer. And this is what we did using a network biology uh, algorithm and approach that is reflected in this figure here. Uh, the algorithm is a bit complicated, but you can see to the right, uh, essentially the steps we follow here. So essentially for every, every node in our network, we compute using some algorithm, the topological features of this node. Second, in the network, we detected all the existing feedback and feed forward loops. And then what we did is we characterize each one of these uh, loops in terms of uh, a number of, of topological uh, properties and um, uh, properties coming from the analysis of, of uh, RNA-seq omics data. So then we rank all the loops based on a score function that aggregated all this information. And at the end, what we did is for the top ranked uh, 
no, uh, regulatory loops, we merge all of them, creating a core network. Just to give you an idea how this works, so what we have essentially is we compute a number of properties that come from the topology of the network, and we compute other properties that come from the data of from existing data from uh, experimental in vitro systems. And then what we do is we aggregate all this information using a score function, which is essentially represented in this red box in the uh, at the bottom. And uh, here, essentially, if you see, this is a, a, a weighted sum of a uh, sum of a number of sub functions, and each one of them is accounting for either a topological feature of this uh, regulatory loop or for a feature related to the data we collect. So, but the idea is that we use this function to rank all the regulatory loops and then select the most important ones. And what we, we get is we ended up with this core network. If you remember, we started with a very large network with thousands of interaction and using this uh, network biology algorithm, we ended up with a network with roughly uh, 40 to 50 nodes and the interactions between them. So you see, we could really focus into a very small part of, of, of this large network. So now we want to, uh, uh, to generate predictive signatures based in this uh, Cori regulatory network. And to do this, essentially, what we do is we transform this network into a mathematical model. And our idea here, uh, the type of model we use was a multi-value logic model. No? So we essentially make use of Boolean functions together with some, for some selected nodes in the network, multi-value functions to create a, 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 a computational model. So the model we, we got is essentially represented in this figure here. You see with the three different colors, the three parts of our network, we have an input layer that contains some key uh, molecules in our network and some receptors that account for signals and come from outside the network. Then we have the intracellular circuit that connects these out input signals uh, with all the other important molecules we consider. And then we have an output layer in blue at the bottom here, which is essentially a, no, uh, a node that uh, integrates all the information and tells us whether in a given configuration of the system, this system is able to induce uh, uh, very aggressive behavior in the tumor cells. So then once we have the model, what we did essentially is we make a number of systematic uh, computational simulations to try to generate uh, disease uh, signatures. And this is what I reflect in this table here. Essentially, what we did is here, all the first columns are the inputs in our network. And what we did essentially is we systematically perturb the values of all, all these input uh, nodes in our network and compute the value of the output node. And what we found out that there's, there is a configuration of the model, a combination of the input signals that, that triggers totally this aggressive behavior of the tumor cells, which is reflected in the very la, uh, last uh, row in our table. So essentially what this in silico signature indicates is that high levels of uh, E2F1 together with two receptors, TGF, beta, uh, B, uh, R2, and EGF, are, are able to promote this very aggressive behavior in the tumor cells. So this is essentially a prediction based on our network. And then what we did is with this information, we went uh, and talked with our experimental collaborators and together we designed an experiment to validate this. This is essentially what we represent in this figure here. So this is the output of an in vitro experiment with uh, aggressive cancer cells and what our collaborators did here essentially is they inhibit alone each one of the factors we predicted or in combination. And what they found out is when they uh, inhibit all of them uh, at the same time, they are able to totally essentially abolish the aggressiveness, the ability of these cancer cells to invade other tissue and to behave in a very aggressive manner. Just to somehow uh, finalize our analysis, we took our signature went to existing repositories of patient data, and we tried to see whether our signature correlated with differences in the survival of the patients. And here in this figure, the interesting point is what you have at the very end here. You see, 
So here uh, we have for this signature we found based on our analysis, we found out that uh, when you have uh, higher values of the three of these uh, molecules, the patients have in the existing data a, a, a much worse prognosis than when you have lower values of them. No? So this is essentially a confirmation of the signature that is uh, made by mining existing data in um, public repositories. No? Yeah, so that's essentially uh, what I wanted to tell you and just to somehow uh, make a, a final uh, explanation of what we do here. As uh, I told you, important in biology and in biomedicine is the genes and how they interact with each other. And what people have found in the last decade or so is that the genes are part of large and complex networks. And then, so one possibility here to account for this complexity is to uh, uh, reconstruct these networks and model these networks using computational models and use simulations of these computational models to predict, for example, in our case, cancer signatures. And the, the interesting question here is that these models actually are encoding for a mechanistic understanding of the disease. So we really have into the equations of the model how the molecules interact with each other. And then the idea is that the signatures you generate this model can help us making therapeutic decisions. So can help us deciding which patients may benefit from a given therapy or can also be used. I'm not talking here about that, but this is something uh, we and our people are doing, this information can be used to suggest new therapies or to reuse, reutilize uh, existing drugs in a different manner. And this is essentially what I wanted to, to show you today. I, this is just a very final uh, slide. Uh, we have been supported over the years uh, by the German Federal Ministry of, of uh, Research and Education in a number of projects related to systems biology and cancer, and also by other uh, local foundations here in, in, in our area in Franconia. And uh, this is uh, actually what I'm showing here is essentially a um, output of a multidisciplinary team composed by uh, compu com compu computer scientists making mathematical modeling, different types of bioinformaticians, computational biologists, and of course, uh, several um, experimentalists that, uh, that are expert on this topic. And uh, I think with this I'm finished and I'm open for, uh, for any discussion. Julio, thank you very much for the presentation. This was really a great talk and I have some applause for you. <laughs> Thanks. So. We only have a virtual audience, but at least that you get the impression of uh, a full audience in person. <laughs> and it's very good virtual effect about your presentation. <laughs> we, we actually do have a couple of questions. Maybe you stop uh, you stop the screen sharing such that yes. we can see you in uh, full uh, color and now. And excellent, great. Um, I, I do have a, a couple of questions here. So, and they are they range from from uh, rather basic ones uh, up to more detailed mathematical ones. Uh, one question that came up very early in your talk is you mentioned that the the cancer cells they develop resistance. So, it appears that they are learning. And um, is that because the, the survival of the fittest or is there a learning process involved? So how, how can we imagine that they develop those resistances? Yeah, yeah, this is actually a very interesting question. Um, there are several mechanisms that can play a role here. One of them is, as you say, the survival of the fittest. So essentially what we know now is that a tumor is not a homogeneous population of cancer cells, but a heterogeneous population. So you have a lot of uh, different clones uh, sharing the tumor and competing with each other. And when you uh, apply a chemo uh, any type of uh, anti-cancer therapy, also chemotherapy, essentially you are in, uh, inducing a new uh, survival factor there that change the balance, the equilibrium between the populations. So essentially what you do is you are favoring one, some of the populations against others. So this is one type of mechanism. Mm -hmm. But 
you are right. There's also other types of mechanisms that look like more a learning process. So one of them, for example, is there are many of them, but one of them is, for example, some of the drugs that we use for killing cancer cells, they actually induce uh, mutations in the in the DNA of the tumor cells. So they change uh, the sequence of the DNA of the and of the cancer cells. In most of the cases, these changes actually kill the cells. So they totally destroy the machinery of the cells, and they die. But in a few cases, some of these mutations give an uh, evolutive advantage to the cells. And then what it may happen is that in some cases cases, you are actually uh, generating a, next, a second generation of tumor cells that may eventually survive to the therapy you were using. And this actually has been uh, observed experimentally. Wow, yeah. that's, that's interesting. So it's uh, so I mean, this is generally a, a super complex system that you're investigating. And that's that's a huge challenge. Uh, there's also so many scale scales involved, right? So you have things happening on molecular level, but then there's there's also forces involved, and cells are interacting with each other. And this is, can can we exclude some of the scales? Is there some things that are irrelevant, like like motoric factors and uh, stress, uh, like physical stress, or do we know about that? This is actually uh, this is also a very interesting comment. So here I'm showing you essentially models that are accounting for what happened molecularly inside the cells and how this somehow influence some of the behavior of the cells. But other people also work uh, generating uh, multi-scale models for the tumors. So then these people also considering the you of course use different types of models. Some of them are agent-based models, and we have in the team some uh, of your former students that are actually working on, on this type of models. But also other people are including in advanced models uh, these uh, intracellular uh, forces, so these mechanical forces and how they influence the shape of the cells and the ability to migrate and percolate through the tissue and so on. Yeah. There, there, this, you know, this is always a question you know, of, uh, this is the art of modeling. So you, you, you have to really narrow down your scenario uh, and discard some effects. And then you can use, in some cases, ordinary differential equations or, uh, or Boolean models. But if you find out that you want to account for other effects, you have to go for agent-based models or more physical level, like uh, physical forces models. I think essentially everything plays a role and uh, yeah, and also the problem we, we face here in, in biomedicine is that of course you have to pair the complexity of the model to the data you have available or your collaborators can produce. And uh, let's say 20 years ago uh, or so, uh, there was very few data experimentalists could measure at the same time, just a few molecules, a few proteins. And now they can measure the entire genome of, of the cells. They can actually, using some types of, of uh, sequencing, differentiate between the different clones you have in the tumor, how they are molecularly different. So you can go for single cell level. Uh, and if they can even, and this is something I think you are more familiar with, they can uh, use quite sophisticated imaging techniques to see how different type of cells make up the tumor and change over the time. Mm -hmm. And then what you, what you essentially observe are, are expressions. So this means how, how many observations or how many molecules of that particular type or, or proteins yeah. of that particular type can be identified. Yeah, this, this, is, yeah. this is a very good question that, uh, I mean, biology and biomedicine uh, you make use of, of uh, a bit uh, compared to other uh, fields in, in science is a, a, a bit unprecise language. So expression in this case, in our case, mean, can mean uh, the amount of protein of the different proteins you have there, or also the amount of the RNAs that code for the protein or even other type, other levels of uh, of data that you can generate quantitatively. Quantitatively. So it's um, it it depends. But in in general, in our case, 
it accounts for uh, the, the levels of the RNAs that encode for the proteins and also for the levels of the proteins. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a kind of sum or projection of what's happening on, on molecular level. Yes, yes, and you are right. It's a sum because at least in this model here, we are uh, we are summing over the whole population of of the tumor cells. <laughs> there are some experimental techniques that you can use, and then you can measure uh, individually each one of the cells, and then see what happens in each one of them. Mm -hmm. But this is not what we use at that time. This is uh, a newer technology. We are using it now. Uh, yeah, but this is essentially it's now possible, but it's not included here. Hmm. How, how do you come up with the mathematical equations for your ordinary differential equations? So, uh, I mean, selecting the right factors and, and just the design of the equation itself is, is not that straightforward, right? Yes, yes, you are totally right. So usually, I mean, this is um, a bit... Um, let, let me try to explain. Depending on what kind of computational model you, you want to construct, you, there are available some methods that allow for a very systematic reconstruction of the network. And this is, for example, something you can do with Boolean models and multi-value, well, multi-value models, more or less, and with other types of uh, models in network biology that somehow have a similar philosophy. But when you are using all the models, at least the way we did it, it it's somehow more uh, manual curation. So you have to, you know, out of your bioinformatic, bioinformatic analysis, which are the important uh, nodes. And then you have to read papers to try to figure, figure out how they interact with each other. You talk with the experimentalists that collaborate with you to help you deciding what is really important. And, and, and then you have to mix all of this with a bit of art and make a lot of assumptions. So it's not very systematic, actually. Uh, this this sounds a lot like neural network design. <laughs> so you uh, read okay, papers, good. you talk to experts, you think what is a good idea, and then you come up with your neural network that just fits the trick. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, in, I mean, in recent years, I think there's some people working on uh, algorithms that try to make a more automatic reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then this also depends a lot on what, which, which kind of equations you use in your ordinary differential equations. So some equations are not very good for systematic reconstruction, but there are other mathematic uh, equations you can use that really allow for very systematic reconstruction. For example, some of them that are used probably also, and you have here uh, about this power law equations. So power law equations are very, homogeneous, so, and then you can reconstruct entire uh, large networks using power law functions, and this is very systematic. So, And the, the actual simulations that you're running is that you essentially apply the ODEs in succession. So you start with a starting configuration, and then you evaluate them over several cycles, and in the end, you have the simulation result. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is essentially what you do is uh, once you have calibrated or trained your model with uh, existing data to give values to the parameters. So you select a number of uh, parameters in the model that you want to perturb, right? And then you perturb it uh, uh, with a given initialization of the model. You run the simulation and then depends on what you are looking for. You have to look at the entire simulation or you look at the very end point of the simulation. So in, in, this, in the case of the paper, I discuss it here. I run the simulation for a number of hours, and I selected what happened at the very end of the simulation. This is the, lay, the data I collected. And then what the, the point is I somehow created a population of simulations where I change randomly the, some of the parameters uh, for each one of them, run the simulations, and then somehow collect the output of the simulation and make some statistics out of out of this uh, of this uh, simulation, so I would say I make a lot in parallel, a lot of simulations, and then I make statistics out of them. Okay, and how do you select or how do you determine the ODE parameters when you when you calibrate the model? Is that... Yeah, yeah, this is a, also a very important question. Um, I mean, there are very options, there are several options here. If you are very lucky and uh, there's a lot of uh, quantitative dynamic data for the system you are thinking on, uh, or you have a collaborator able to make this type of uh, time series experiments, 
then you can make a full train of your model doing the uh, data feeding. No? So you take uh, your model, you run it, and you apply the maximum likelihood principle to, to look for values of the parameters that match uh, as much as possible the data you have available. Many cases, you don't have that much of the data. So then what you have to do is a bit of data mining, look into papers for values for given parameters, make some additional assumptions for all the parameters, sometimes even apply, and this is something I do very often, normalization to the equations, and then you reduce the number of parameters you have to estimate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, again, you, you can follow two, two different, if you are lucky and you have a, a lot of data, you can make fully automatic calibration of the model. And there's an entire community of people developing computational algorithms for making this training of the models. If you don't have that much of the, of the data, you can still make a, a model, but you have to somehow mine the data manually. Yeah, I must say, this is a really exciting field, in particular these targeted therapies where you essentially use the, the tagging of the tumor in order to, to treat that particular tumor of the patient. So this on, on an individual basis, it's very exciting. So do you think we will have, have beat cancer very soon? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, this, this is, a, you know, this cancer is... It's a, a really wide concept, no? So, I mean, it's true that for a number of tumors, we are already kind of beating the uh, disease, no? So you have, depending if the tumor is detected soon and some other conditions in your genetic background, for example, you can get totally cured for... Uh, for, uh, from the disease, no? So this is, for example, there's a case for some types of thyroid uh, tumor. There, if you, it's uh, the diagnosis come very, very soon and you get surgery, you are totally cured. For other tumors, we have developed some very new therapies in the last decade or so. And then you have, for example, in case of melanoma, uh, we have immune therapies that are able to cure, so really cure, so keep people uh, alive for more than 10 years, uh, up to ha uh, half of the people that suffer metastatic tumor. So this means uh, for some tumors, you can really cure it and people are cured kind of forever. For other tumors, if you are in the lucky 50%, you get cured, really cured. And then for many other tumors, everything is open. So uh, some of them, uh, some people get cured, other people get uh, so, uh, can survive for five to 10 years and they, later on they relapse. And other tumors, there's uh, very little to do. So it's, there's, uh, it's very diverse. So, uh, but uh, the reality is that there's a lot of people uh, selling uh, this idea that cancer is cured. I wouldn't say that. But I can, what we can definitely say is that there are a number of very new therapies. So new means last five years that were approved. And they are working very well in some tumors that were totally incurable 10 years ago, like for example, melanoma. So this is the, the, the reality that we have now a chance. So a chance that there are therapies that seems to work. And now we can probably iterate these therapies, combine it, and uh, step by step increase uh, the amount of people that get uh, cured. Yeah, to me, it's amazing to see that such a complex system, I mean, you at least partially need to understand it very well in order to treat cancer. And it's, it's quite amazing that in the last couple of years, we already managed to develop such therapies. And of course, I'm, I think it's exciting to work in this field and there is at least to what I believe, I think there's quite a bit more to come. So, yeah, 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 definitely true. Um, you are, I mean, what you are mentioning is, is true. Actually, these new therapies, these new immunotherapies are actually based in very basic, uh, fundamental understanding of some mechanic mechanisms in the tumor. So, it works to understand mechanisms sometimes, of course, but it's also true. I didn't mention here, but I would say at least half of the community working on systems medicine 
are following are a pro an approach that is much closer to what you do there in pattern recognition laboratories. So we have a lot of people, and this is something we do and we try to combine uh, with what we do here. Uh, there's a lot of people applying machine learning algorithms to these uh, large amounts of uh, patient data, rna seq data, to help finding uh, predictive signatures for cancer, but even also to find new therapies. So this is also an, uh, a new field that is coming, and there's a lot of uh, work to do there. Julio. Thank you for this presentation. This was very exciting. And I think it's it's also great to get to know the field and understand a bit better what, uh, you know, systems biology and, and bioinformatics is doing. And I enjoyed your talk. You've seen there's plenty of questions that came up. So also a lot of people got very interested in what you presented. And I would like to thank you for giving this talk here. And I have another round of applause for you. Thanks. <laughs> Many thanks for the opportunity and hopefully in the future we can, uh, I or any of the collaborators can come back here and uh, show you some of the other results we are working on. So, Absolutely. We'll Exciting work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andreas. Bye-bye. Hi. Yeah, so you've seen there was a vivid discussion when Julio was present in the presentation, many questions about the basics of bioinformatics and also advanced questions about the modeling. I think there might be one or two open questions. So if you have questions, please ask them in the comments or send us an email, contact us on social media, and we'll be glad to answer them. So. Thank you very much for listening and looking forward to see you again in another episode of Beyond the Patterns. Bye-bye.